Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this LinkedIn Live. The topic dealing with difficult business partner, probably something that many people may have found relevant, right? And uh, by the way, when we talk about uh, difficult business partners, you know, we may have uh, different views about uh, what kind of uh, business partner comes to your mind. Now, I was doing just this week uh, a LinkedIn survey to understand, you know, what kind of people you found more difficult to work with. But I will be interested to hear from our audience. What kind of difficult business partner do you encounter? So that this gives also some insight to Amy and I, because I have the pleasure today to be with Amy Carroll, an amazing executive coach with whom I had the pleasure to personally work over 10 years ago when I was with Merck. And uh, she's really brilliant and she helped me a lot. And uh, we stayed in touch, of course, since then. And it's a pleasure to welcome her uh, to this LinkedIn Live. And uh, so let's, let's listen to the audience. Let's see. I mean, you can tell us where you're, con you're, where you're connecting from. You, you can tell us uh, uh, where are you right now. But also, how about telling us, you know, what kind of difficult business partner you have most challenges with? Is people that are aggressive, is people that are indecisive, is people that are complaining, or what kind of people you have a challenge with? So tell us more and also let us know where are you connecting? You know, you're talking with uh, Amy, who is an American, Giuseppe is an Italian, but we are both living in Switzerland. And uh, let's see where uh, our audience is coming from today. So we start seeing in that also the first views about, you know, the kind of uh, difficult people that uh, we have a challenge with. So for instance, people don't, people don't collaborate. Okay, right. You know, people who are stubborn. People, yeah. they're stubborn. Yes. Okay. Amsterdam, Stormier. Wow. Okay. Lausanne, hey. hello. Hello. And let's listen. Okay. There are, uh, we have uh, Tanya from uh, Lisbon. Okay. And uh, difficult business partner, those who don't say yes or not, but string you along. Any tips on how to change that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Le Zurich, people are stubborn and not open. Okay. Why? Wow. Love from Turkey. Liechtenstein. <laughs> Netherlands. Uh, uh, people that have a hard time listening to you, people that do not want to share information. Okay. People that are aggressive. Mm, okay. Many fear to be challenged, to be out of their comfort zone. Okay. Yeah, yeah Switzerland people who want everything immediately, right? You know, that sounds, uh, yes, the leave, difficult situation rather than people. Ah, okay, Jane. Okay, Switzerland again. So we have a good number of people that are connecting with, with, from Switzerland. People with strong opinion, ego, and with little respect for others. Okay, all right. So, by the way, also Anas is joining us from uh, from Tunisia. Good to see you again, Anas. And uh, people who are we fail to connect with, people who are very territorial. Wow. Okay, listen. You know, there is so much, uh, so many difficult situations that we encounter. So that's. Uh, uh, that will give us plenty of opportunity, let's say, to talk and to understand, you know, what uh, we can uh, do to be better together. Now, uh, before we go into the questions, and by the way, this is your LinkedIn life, so don't let me do all the questioning. I'm sure you will have questions from uh, Amy, but in the meantime, let's get to know Amy a bit more. So tell us a few words about yourself, Amy. Sure. Ciao, Giuseppe. I call myself, as you know, a communication coach, trainer, professional speaker. And as of last year, I've added radio show host to that list. And 
Giuseppe, what makes me so passionate is helping people see how they might be unknowingly sabotaging themselves through the way they're communicating. And then to help them do things differently with their body language, voice, words, and mindset to be able to deal with those difficult business partners. Um, I think that's all I'll, I'll say for now. I work around the globe and no, I, yes, I guess I'm saying more. <laughs> um, what I find is even though I'm so American, this approach, it applies in so many different cultures. And right now I've been working a lot with some Japanese clients and even in Japan, it, it applies. So that's what's so exciting about the work I do is how applicable it is because it, it, the, the bottom line is showing respect and not just respect for the other respect for ourselves. When we have that magical formula and that balance, that's where unexpected positive things can happen. Yep. During okay. the challenge. Interesting. Now, you know, we got uh, so many input from our audience about the kind of things that they have a challenge with. Now, in your experience, what common challenges do professionals face when it comes to communicating with difficult partners, difficult stakeholders? Well, believe it or not, our ego gets in the way a lot of the time. We have an urge to be right. And I'm certainly speaking from my personal experience. And we have an urge to defend ourselves if we think someone disagrees with us or is accusing us of something. And this can show up, you know, I mentioned a second ago, body language, voice, words. This urge to be right or to defend ourselves often comes in fast speaking and, and explaining ourselves. And, and, then, and then we show our, in, our frustration on our face and, and, and our body language. And then we interrupt the other person and then we're interrupting. So we're not even hearing what they're saying. So sometimes we sabotage an exchange because our ego's gotten triggered or we're feeling intimidated or disrespected. Mm -hmm. So uh, it may have to do also with uh, how we feel with, you know, what's the behavior of the other person that triggers in us, right? Yes. So for some, you know, you could say something to me and one person would think it was funny and laugh and another person would take offense to it. Another person would be intimidated by it. So we're all walking around the world carrying our own baggage and it's causing us to react differently. Okay. Now, uh, when we work together, uh, Amy, I remember that you take me through, you know, your model, right? You know, the predator yeah. prey partner. I mean, can you explain, you know, what is the predator prey partner model and why is a game changer? Yes. So this model was first developed, as you might remember, by my sister, Pat Kirkland. She's a recovering prey. And as you may also know and remember, Giuseppe, I'm a recovering predator. Luckily, Pat, my sister, was, is the older, taller sibling. So she was always safe. And she was always wanting to please people and be nice and avoid conflict. And I was walking around the world being insulted by everyone and thinking everyone was either disrespecting me or someone else. So sometimes I would react as a predator as a, what I call a protective predator, because I've told myself a story that someone was being disrespectful to me or someone else. So this model, um, most of the time, like you and I right now, Giuseppe, we're being partners. We're holding high respect for ourselves and high respect for the other all as well. The problem under pressure, stress, perceived threat, crisis, COVID, or just if we're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, <laughs> Two of those things happened to me today already. <laughs> Don't worry, I, I've been fed recently, so you're okay. I uh, will either go predator, which is Giuseppe, just Giuseppe, would you just let me finish? And I'm being aggressive and disrespectful towards you, even though either I may not realize it or it may not be my intention. Or the other extreme is just Giuseppe, Giuseppe, I'm so sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but but can I explain, please? I'm so sorry. And now I'm holding too much respect for you, not enough for me. And that might, you know, this is important for your audience to realize that's 
particularly dangerous because that could trigger even a nice person, even someone like Giuseppe could become a predator towards me. Hard to believe. And it could happen if I'm not holding enough respect for myself. So the magic is high respect for the other, high respect for ourselves, regardless of the positional power. And that's what partner is. And you want to step in partner before you need it. Stay in partner when the going gets tough. And remain in partner even if you don't get what you want. Because at any one of those stages, magic can happen. And I guess one more thing I want to say, Giuseppe, is well, people say, well, you know, don't both people have to be playing partner for it to work? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> it's a lot nicer when that's the case. Though as long as one of us, meaning you, yourselves, as long as you're holding what I call a partner frame, you are going to um, invite most people in. So if, let's say under pressure, I, I would, if I still went predator under pressure, and Giuseppe knows this, and he decides to hold this strong partner frame with me. As a predator, I feel the respect Giuseppe's holding for himself, which has hot makes add a higher value to the respect he's showing me. And as a result, that's making me want to recalibrate my own behavior in order to keep it coming. Because I know that Giuseppe is only going to put up with my misbehavior for so long. The other extreme is if I'm a prey and Giuseppe sees, oh, Amy's being a prey. He's holding a strong partner frame where he's holding high respect for me, high respect for himself. I'm feeling safe and respected. And I'm more likely to stay partner or step into partner with him. So the power of this model is that both people don't have to be playing partner to, for it to work. You, if you hold a stronger frame, most people will step into it. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Now, of course, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy to continue to be a, a partner. I mean, uh, what what would you suggest, you know, because of course, you know, you mentioned the emotion are there, you know, the physical needs or whatever. And uh, so what would you suggest uh, to our audience, you know, to, to remain partner even when we are faced with aggression? Well, there's, there's pre-work and there's in the moment work. The pre-work, I, I, I'm, I've started recommending therapy to everyone. <laughs> and it, one, it's paid off for me. And two, most of, most human beings were carrying trauma with us either our own from our own lives or that's been passed down through generations. So I believe it's a responsibility for us as, a, as professionals, as healthy human beings to heal that past trauma. One, so that's the one in a long-term investment. And the second thing is in the moment, although you also want to practice this before you need it so that you'll have it available to you is things like, um, I guess, you know what, I use this term emotional Aikido. And it's in, it's, you're working in two directions, from outside in, body language, voice, words, and inside out. So internal, external. So let's start with the internal. This is the mindset. And this is what I wrote my book on, The Ego Tango. You want to hold the relationship as the highest importance. And I get it, that's tough in the business world when you need results. Yet, if you hold results as the highest, hold the relationship at the highest, most importance, you it's an investment in the relationship. And another way to say it is consider it, looking at it like marriage versus a one night stand. You know, we behave very differently when we think I wanna spend the rest of my life with this person. I'm gonna behave myself better. So that's one of the mindset. The other thing is to, and this is also often difficult, assume that the other person has positive intent and it's just the packaging that sucks. Mm -hmm. You know, 
most of us aren't have not trained ourselves to manage our internal emotions. And I'm not saying hide the emotions. When you express them, you express them calmly and directly. And then the, another mindset technique is, and this is really powerful. And Giuseppe, I'd be curious to know if from a negotiation perspective, if you agree with this, I think it's incredibly disarming and powerful when we acknowledge at least to ourselves and maybe even better to the other person that you're attached to a certain outcome. And what this does, it makes you appear less subjective and more objective. And it may even cause you to be more objective. Now, okay. Yeah, go, go, go. You want to no, comment? No, no, no. Let, let's try to clarify it also for our audience. What you're saying is that you want to convey to the other party that uh, you are attached to a positive outcome of the discussion, right? You know, let... No, I'm, I'm attached to a certain outcome. I, re I really want to get this budget by approved by Thursday. So I'm admitting that I'm attached to wanting a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it makes me a little bit vulnerable because I'm, you know, we think, oh, you go into negotiation, you're supposed to act, you know, oh, it's, well, maybe that's not true though. When you're having a conversation with someone, you maybe not necessarily negotiation, you act like, oh, I'm totally open to your ideas when we, we rarely are. <laughs> so if we admit, hey, I, I really want this thing, and I just want to admit that and put it on the table and, and I might be a bit attached to this. It makes you look less subjective and more objective. Mm -hmm. Less biased and, um, and more open. And then the other person's kind of like, oh, wow, that's you know really cool that she admitted that. So showing vulnerability is a very powerful approach. And then... There's another one. If you if, audience, if you want to take your your partner behaviors to a whole nother level, the next time you have a disagreement with someone, okay, get ready. Actively defend the other person's point of view. <laughs> Find reasons why you might be honestly wrong, or their idea might have some great merits, might make sense. And it, it'll be scary because we don't know how things will turn out, though. Once again, it leads to that being, you know, showing more objectivity, more fairness. And the person you often will respond really well to that. Yeah, exactly. So I, the message here, right, you know, you're going for a discussion, let's say you're asking uh, I don't know, more budget uh, to the finance director or you're asking for a raise to your boss or whatever. And they're telling you, sorry, it's not possible because we had a difficult year with COVID and uh, we are not going to be able to give you the budget for this project. So what, yeah. even if you disagree 99% with what they're saying, find the 1% where you agree. That's the message, yeah. right? You know, look for something, then start to defend. Yes, you know, I understand. You know, of course, you know, this, you know, we don't know. We have been through two difficult years and we don't know if we are really over because another way may come. And uh, I understand that we need to be prudent because we will never know if the business is going to come back, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's yeah. what's the message of Amy, that you find all the possible reason why what they're saying makes sense. And Giuseppe, I encourage people to practice these skills in lower stress exchanges so that they can be ready for those business conversations. And I encourage people to use these skills in all areas of their lives. So if your teenager is coming to you to say, you know, I want to take the car uh, this weekend and I want to take my friends and you're thinking, oh, my God, no way. That's, a, you know, they're not responsible enough or they had that accident or and you want to say no right away. Can you suspend? your decision, can you be willing to enter in that conversation with that person and say, I totally get why you would want to take the car. And yeah, and yeah, and then you could you could all go together and just um, have a willingness to see why that other person's idea makes sense, why it's a good idea and why maybe your idea is not a good idea. That doesn't mean any decisions are being made at this point. You're investing in the relationship. You're showing the person what you want, what you say matters to me, 
I care. I want to hear it. I'm interested. And maybe it might influence you to change, or maybe your approach and style might influence them to be willing to listen to you. So those are all the, that's most of the, like a, a lot of the mindset stuff. And then if we switch to the external part of body language, voice, words, you know, Giuseppe, I have a whole list of powerful uh, verbal and nonverbal and body language tips, though I would say my top three. Listen, listen, listen. Okay, that's that's just my top one. <laughs> so I'm just going to say it three times because it's really, really important. When we actively listen, we can stay engaged. And then we check for understanding. Now, if you and I are in a disagreement and I say, so Giuseppe, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're saying is that if we don't resolve this issue with the stakeholder, we're, it's going to be a, a huge cost to us. And so you can then say, yes, Amy, that's right. Or no, you could correct me if I got it wrong, if, you, if I misheard you. You could correct yourself if you wanted to say something else. So then we're increasing the understanding between us. And then the third element is that sometimes just someone hearing their words fed back to them by the other person offers them empathy. So if we're in a disagreement with someone and we take the time to slow down, to check that we heard them correctly, we're calming the energy, which makes it harder to fight and disagree. And we're also offering, potentially offering empathy to the other person, which is Hope, helping them to feel seen and heard and respected that key word respected mm -hmm. and then uh, can i add one more yep um this i learned a few months ago i attended a, an improv conference and you know i love improvisational theater and applying it to non-performance relationships and one of the things i learned from the conference was when you're in a conversation with someone and you're in a disagreement that after you've checked and you understood what you said, you know, did I hear that right? Okay. And then you would say, you know, Giuseppe, what I appreciate about that is. And then you, I would add an insight I had or somehow that benefited me. You know, I, I might say, Giuseppe, what I appreciate it about what you just said is that it helps me understand why this is so important for you. And so just by saying, you know, what you appreciate about what they said, whether or not you agree with it in the long run, whether or not you're going to make any changes, just let them know what it is about what they said you appreciate. Wow. Okay, we can get dig deeper into you know, the different things that you suggested, body language, the voice, uh, and at words level. But let's first, because I see that there are uh, some comments, you know, this... Uh, predator prey partner model you know is attracting attention so just uh, let's uh, look at uh, a couple of comments from our audience you know and uh, to what extent are hierarchical difference already predefining the roles um so hierarchical differences if this person and you can clarify audience member if i misunderstand i believe what you're asking is um when there's a difference in power structure so if that's what you mean by it, I'll answer that question. And, and this, again, I've worked with many cultures where hierarchical differences matter more in certain cultures than others. And this approach shockingly still works. And what you hold in your mind is I'm holding high respect for the other and high respect for me. So the problem with some of these hierarchical, different, hierarchical differences is that we tend, when we have someone more senior to us, we tend to show them more respect and, our, and we hold less respect for ourselves. And that's dangerous because it could trigger a predator reaction. And I get that in some cultures, people are expecting to have that deference and that difference. And I believe you can still have a blend of showing the respect while still holding high respect for yourself. Or if you're the more senior person, um, holding a lot of respect for the other person while still holding the respect for yourself and not to an extreme. So is it, um, what extent is it predefined? It's, 
in the sense that you know the more senior person is likely to be always the predator and that the more junior absolutely. person is likely to be always the prey absolutely right? absolutely and when I, you know, um, Giuseppe, something I've been exploring the last couple of years is the difference in the professional world versus the personal world. And professionally, that's exactly how it is. The higher the higher position you have, the more protected you are, the more you're likely to misbehave. So for all of those senior people who are tuning in today, check yourself. <laughs> are you showing up as a bit predator? Are you cutting people off? Are you are you not listening to them? Are you not showing you're listening? Are you um, treating them in a way that you wouldn't treat a police officer if they stopped you for a violation? <laughs> That's always a good check. It's funny how so many of us can behave ourselves as partner when we're stopped by a police officer. So that's my invitation to the, the senior person is make sure while you continue to hold high respect for yourself, you hold high respect for the other. And if you're in the lower position of power, what can you do to still hold to hold more respect for yourself without taking respect away from the other? It doesn't mean, you know, that I go, it's like, it's not a seesaw, you know, one goes up, one goes down. It's I go up and, and here's the irony. If Giuseppe was my boss, or let's say he's the CEO of the company and he's very high. The more respect I hold for myself, the more value the respect has that I show for him. So if you're as lower in the rank, the only way that person's going to, if the person's a reasonable human being, is to really respect you is if you're also holding respect for yourself. And that that messes with our brains and it can feel really scary to step into that space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Now, uh, still on the same topic, right? You know, Nitika is giving us a different perspective. Doesn't that apply only if the person is self-aware of their behavior? Yes, Nitika. And that's why I am on a mission. <laughs> and what's fascinating, Nitika, is how many people I meet. So what happens is, um, Often I meet someone and I'm like, oh my gosh, this person's such a predator. And, you know, just because they're showing up with these perceived behaviors of predator. And then I share the model with them, predator, prey partner. And I say, so under pressure, do you think you go more predator or more prey? And the person so often says, oh, I'm such a prey. <laughs> I stopped falling off my chair. And Natika, what that's telling me is that there is not the level of self-awareness. So for all of you, if you dare to find the person who knows you best in the world, who's seen you on your good days and seen you on your bad days, who you think is willing to tell you, speak their truth and ask them under pressure, do I become disrespectful to you, to, to others? Because you may not be respect, disrespectful to them, though you might become disrespectful to others. That, that to me is a very brave person to ask that question. Though what that does is it closes the gap in awareness really fast. Because now, once you realize, oh no, people perceive me as a predator, that's not my intention. You can fast forward your learning process. Mm -hmm. Now, let's... Uh... Let's continue with the audience. I mean, there are so many questions coming. So, you know, you're really attracting uh, lots of interest with your comments. So let, let's listen to what Natasha says. Isn't it dangerous to show one's vulnerability to someone we believe is a predator? May that person not rise to that occasion, to the occasion. Oh, Natasha, that's a really intuitive point you're making. So let me think a couple things I want to say about that. You want to make sure you show your vulnerability packaging it as a partner. So if I say, if, if I know that Giuseppe is a predator and I go, <laughs> Giuseppe, it's, it's just that this is, this is really important to me. I, I, I really have to have. Okay. And now I'm packaging it as a prey. I'm begging that 
any kind of prey behavior could trigger a predator reaction from someone. So that's the first rule is if you choose to show your vulnerability to someone who you believe is a predator, make sure you do it holding respect for yourself, calm, cool, and collected. So instead I might say to Giuseppe, if he's a predator, yeah, you know, Giuseppe, I got to say, this is really important for me. Okay. So you see there's, even if inside I'm panicking and stressed, I've trained the outside packaging to keep the body calm, to keep direct eye contact. And if you'll notice, I had a, a very soft, what I call the warm smile, you know, Giuseppe, this is really important for me. And the other thing I'm doing is I'm going really slow. It's very hard for someone to stay or uh, become aggressive if we're going nice and slow. Mm -hmm. Great, great insight. Let's listen to Regina. You use an interesting word. This sucks. Very American. For me, this is a good vocabulary when being international, international trained. However, if you deal with an, a difficult business partner who is very local, then, can, then can wording is a bit, that, uh, they can be wording a big issues. They yeah. be provocative. Dealing with a Generation Z or, or, or Millennium in business conversation, what is your comment to the vocabulary? Fuck. I, I have not even considered this point. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, I think we've disappeared behind this very rich question from Regina, which is <laughs> her name, too. So okay. I, my answer, Regina, is so fascinating you're asking this because before I, before the word sucks, uh, the, what I said was uh, maybe it's their packaging that sucks. I, I, I remember assessing, it, Amy, would it, is, it, is this okay for you to say this now? Now, Giuseppe and I know each other. He's a lovely person. He's easygoing. He's accepting. And he knows part of who I am is authentic, being authentic and, and showing my authenticity to a certain extent. So it feel in for me as an American, the word sucks. It's a quite colloquial and it's a it's quite casual for the business world. So it's a little bit edgy. And I did it because I wanted the audience to really be able to say, yeah, she gets it. You know, that's it. That's true. It's not fair when people misbehave. And the word fuck it for me is a much stronger word. So I would not use it for me personally. And I would probably coach other people to at the very worst say, Ugh! and I would stop there. Uh, you know, frig, uh, you know, or um, flambouille. You know, I might make up a word, though I'm saying it with the energy of the frustration. So, Regina, feel free to comment further if you feel like that hasn't fully addressed your point. Okay. Uh, now, let's. Uh, we, we could spend uh, a full day here with all the questions we're getting, but okay, let's, let's take a few more. And uh, but uh, when we want a decision, should we do the same? Defend the other idea? Yeah, <laughs> I know it's scary, and you might not be ready to do it. And you might want to do a role play with a friend or a partner or a sibling. Say, okay, I got to have this business conversation with someone. This is what they want. This is what I want. I'm going to test out this approach. And let them know how that business person tends to behave. They can be difficult or resistant. Um, and sometimes you need to practice it in safer environments before you're confident or willing to test it out in the wor real world. And just because you're defending their point of view doesn't mean you still don't want your own. You don't, you still don't, you know, you, you want a decision. And so let me see if I can think of it as an example. You know, Giuseppe, you were talking about um, that the budget needs to be a hundred thousand for this project. And 
from my perspective, I can see why we need to really cap it at 100,000 because we've got other projects in the pipeline and and we and we have a limited amount of funds. And that makes a lot of sense. Yet, notice how slowly I'm going. So I'll do it again. And this is this is a great, you know, I'm showing agreement. Yet, from my perspective, I still feel very strongly that we need to raise it to 150,000 for this, this, and this reason. So I guess my question for you now, Giuseppe, is can we find a way to justify the extra budget knowing the other projects we have? Do we have any leeway or flexibility that we can explore? Okay, so Tanya, what I did there was I'm holding his um, opinion perspective as valid and legitimate. I'm saying, yes, I, I hear you. I agree with why that's important to you and it makes sense. And yet, so we can hold two opposing ideas. And, and by going slow and willing to be in the discomfort and explore that, sometimes magical things can happen. And the whole, long, the whole way along, you're holding high respect for yourself, high respect for the other, and they're more, they're going to be more willing to engage with you longer. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go with one more question from Kutsi. Yes. Kutsi. I, I agree with appreciating what they say, then empathizing that's partner mode. However, accepting their position when I don't agree with it, I believe is prey mode. I know there are people that will view that as a submission and always take advantage. So could Z, that my friend is your ego dying a slow, painful death. <laughs> and let me be clear that I'm not saying um, you would only agree if you, you, you want to find some part of it or some reason where you validly agree. So it's not necessary and pray is more about packaging. When our egos are triggered, when we feel like we're in submission, that feels like prey, except it doesn't necessarily look like prey to the other person. Again, checking your packaging. Um, so let me think about this more. I agree with appreciating what they're saying and it's like that's partner mode. But accepting the So you're, you're only, you're not fully ex necessarily accepting their position um, if you don't agree with it, if you can't find anything to agree on, then that approach would not work, would not be appropriate for you. So what you could say is, you know, um, Giuseppe, what I hear is that you're really saying that it, we need to cap the budget at 100000 Yeah, I got it. I, re I really hear that's important to you. And from my perspective, and watch this, Kudzi, I'm going to not use the word however or but. Not, but from my perspective and from my perspective, I feel strongly that we really need to increase it to 150,000. Now, if you're open to it, I'd like to explain the reasons why I think that's important. Okay. So I'm slowing down the whole process. Once again, I'm, I'm acknowledging, Hey, that's what you want. And in your case, Kuzi, you're saying, yep, yeah, there's nothing in that. I I can agree with that's okay. You're still going to acknowledge. That's your perspective. You're not going to cancel it out by using however or but. <laughs> and then you're you're still bringing it back. This is what I feel we need. And then I added that next part. Um, are you open to hearing the reasons why? So what I did is instead of just going right into the reasons why and insisting and telling. What I, I asked Giuseppe, are you open to it? And so what I'm offering Giuseppe is a tiny little bit of empowerment and and choice that he gets to say yes or no to me. Most reasonable business people will say yes. If they say no, then you're at an impasse and then you say, so it sounds like we're, we haven't found a solution yet because 
you were saying it's got to be a hundred thousand. I'm saying it's got to be a hundred and fifty thousand. My suggestion is that we um, take a, a couple of days to think about this and come back and reflect on it. You know, so it, I'm not saying you're going to get the res it re resolved right in the moment. Though slowing down the entire process will increase the chances of that happening. Does that wow. anything you want to add? Perfect. I mean. Uh... Uh, there is such an interest from the audience. I mean, that's uh, that's amazing. So let's listen to what uh, Umberto tells us. How Ooh. do you push back without compromising the relationship when you are unable to compromise? So Umberto, I, I, I'm going to go out. This is going to be really outrageous, Umberto. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to go off track for a minute. So we have this picture of Umberto and he looks really like... I, you know, he looks confident. He looks sure of himself. And there's three behavior, uh, visual cues that can make people look unintentionally predator or unintentionally like they're in a bad mood. Okay, you ready, Umberto? Because you got two of them, my friend. <laughs> one is no hair. One is a beard. And the third one is glasses. So as you can see, my glasses have sort of a Harry Potter playful look to them. If Umberto, you had dark rim glasses on and you, you'd have the trifecta three for three. And then if you're not smiling, my man, you're going to look really scary to people. <laughs> so in order to continue your fabulous look, I'm going to encourage you, and this is going to be related to your answer, believe it or not is to add, make sure you've got a soft smile. And I would even encourage you to have your, redo a, your LinkedIn picture and do one where it's just, think of this, Umberto. It's, I call it the, I got a secret smile. It looks like this. Just, a, you know, you're smiling from the eyes, all is well. So I'm not suggesting a Disney smile. So not to worry about that. So that's one thing. And when you're doing your soft smile, Umberto, and you're pushing back, you're going to use something called the broken record approach. So the, and, and this comes from the good old days when we used to play records, those discs, you know, the, remember the little needle and, right? And so when it, it's broken, it gets caught, it goes around and around and around. So you're going to say the same thing slowly and calmly each time. And you might, if you can, add a little playfulness, a little humor. So, hey, Giuseppe, um, what can I, I I'm going to be going on a road trip this weekend. Can I borrow your car for the weekend? You say no. So, Giuseppe, go ahead and say no to me. No. Oh, man, you know, I really, um, I love your car and I would love to go on this trip. And I'd really be grateful if you would be willing to let me use your car. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Giuseppe, is there anything that, I mean, okay, here's a weird idea. You know, my friend and I are going on this road trip. If you want to, you can, if you're free this weekend, you can join us because we're going to have a great time. And then you would probably want to use your amazing car on this trip. Would any chance of that happening? Well, let me check my agenda. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all right. All right. So I, I went off a little bit, like I, I got a little creative and added new suggestions. So um, Umberto, um, Umberto, each time I go back to Giuseppe, my job is to stay um, relaxed and easygoing. So, so what happens to many of us is that we get um, more impatient and more frustrated Giuseppe, you told me that you would be able to help me out sometime. And I'm asking for a favor right now. I, I, I'm a good driver. So you see how my eyebrows are up. I'm doing this thing. I'm looking pissed off. And now I want to intimidate him into giving me his car for the weekend. So that's going to be the magic is when you're playing the broken record approach, you continue to act calm, cool, collected. Pleasure, Carson. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, well, uh, oh, 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 let's just talk about Thorson's picture. Oh, my God. Umberto, you've got a model. Look at this smile. He's got 
he's got the no, no hair look. He doesn't have a beard, though he has the glasses. So he has two out of the three, and he's wearing that killer smile. Thorsten, thank you so much for putting your picture up. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, uh, we're not going to be able, we are going to be able to take all the questions. So let me take somebody who has not yet asked the question, so that uh, we can uh, we can see. Okay, okay, let's listen to Mark. You know, watch out watch also out. about cultural aspects. Hmm. As European or American, if you say sorry for something when it was not your fault, you reveal yourself as a prey. Yes. If you don't say sorry, Jane Japan, yeah. even though it was not your fault, you will be considered as a prey. Fascinating. So it's vice versa depending on different cultures. Thank you for that, Mark. Brilliant. Yeah, I have, I, I think that's heat. Mark has said it all. Mm -hmm. So being aware of the culture you're interacting with to make sure that whatever you're doing matches the expectation of the people you're dealing with. Yeah. And if I was well, something, I guess I could add to this, Mark, is uh, for people who are serial apologizers, what I encourage them to do, regardless of the culture, is sometimes replace sorry with thank you. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for waiting. And so with a, if you, you especially like I said, the European American cultures, if you say sorry, that could trigger a predator reaction from someone. Um, whereas if you say thank you, you raise the other person's status, the predator status, without lowering your own. And I'm going to check with my Japanese uh, counterparts to see if they agree that that could also work in Japan, because that's what I've been sharing with them. And so far, they're saying they, they seem to think it's working. But Giuseppe, while we're um, at it, I want to go back to the thing about smiling, why it's so important. And this may, Umberto may be even more inspired. A soft smile is literally telling the other person, today you're safe. Today you won't die. Can't promise tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I used to think that a smile was just nice to have. Now I understand, oh, a smile tells the other person all is well. Yeah. Now, uh, you talked uh, about, uh, you know, body language, about words, but you also talked about voice, right? Yes. And, uh, I remember that uh, you're obsessed with something called, you know, the downward inflection. Totally. What it is, what it is and why it's so impactful. Oh, thank you for asking. It's so nice of you because it is one of my passions, Giuseppe. So let's let me quickly explain to the your audience what the downward inflection sounds like. And I'll do it with a demonstration. This is the most the person, the most famous person in the world who does the downward downward inflection. My name is Bond, James Bond. Now I want you to imagine what if in the first scene of the movie, James Bond introduced himself like this. My name is Bond, James Bond. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he wouldn't have made it to the second scene and he'd probably get shot and there wouldn't be a sequel. <laughs> so the downward inflection, a lot of we, many of us, women and men and certain cultures are socialized to speak with an upward inflection. Whenever we pause, our voice goes up like it's a question. And we do it with our intention to sound approachable and non-threatening. The problem is that it projects um, the message, I'm asking for approval, like me, and, it's own, and it can be appear very prey-like. So I even have predators who do the down, do the upward inflection, then someone else goes predator on them and they go predator on them and they, and it's all because of the inflection. So I encourage people, and the, here's the frustrating part, Giuseppe, is people can't hear it in themselves at first. So grab your smartphone, get that audio recorder, speak into your phone, or do a list of 10 items you're gonna buy from the store. And most likely your voice will go up because meta, symbolically you're putting a comma after each word. And when we put a comma, our voice goes up. 
So the idea is to start to hear it in your voice, to train it for a few minutes every day. Three to five minutes a day is my recommendation for these behaviors. And when I work with my coachees, they've told me that it took them about sometimes eight weeks in order to move to a level of mastery where they could control and do the downward inflection without even having to think about it. And it is worth every minute of practice because the danger is that the upward inflection will trigger a predator reaction in people and in dogs, which happened to me one time. I was doing a workshop, started the, the workshop, did the demonstration of predator prey. And when I did the prey, I said, hi, Good evening. My name is Amy Carroll. I'm happy to be here. Up, up, up. Then all of a sudden there was a little dog that said, rawr, rawr, rawr. isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. And, and in fact, you know, it works very well also with children, by the way, right? You know, if you're a parent and you have small children, then use this downward inflection, downward intonation, and then they're going to listen much better to you. So true. Yeah, I've had testimonials from many parents. <laughs> exactly. Listen, you know, we're getting to the end. You know, we want to make sure that we, it doesn't last more than one hour. Maybe let me get another couple of questions and then we close. Is, you know, you describe your work as emotional Aikido, right? You know, there was this interesting element of, of the emotional Aikido that you were putting through. Now, what are some of the key skills you teach your, your clients to achieve this emotional Aikido? Because well, it may not be so easy, right? You know, to make yeah, it that's happen. the internal, external. So you want to work in those two directions. Check out what is what is your thinking process. Um, what stories are you making up? Are you making up a story that that guy is out to get me, or are you making up a story? Hey, he might be having a bad day. And so that's going to be very powerful because, like um, someone mentioned earlier, the importance of raising awareness. Once I realize, oh, I'm making up a negative story and that's pulling me into predator or prey, I can make up a different story. Not to justify that person's behavior, not to excuse it. Though if I make up a better story about why someone's being difficult, then I'll be more able to stay partner with them, especially if I go to confront them. Because if they're doing behavior that's un inappropriate or unacceptable, you should absolutely confront it. And you wanna be able to confront it as a partner so that you're modeling for them how you want them to treat you as well. So that would be a, the mindset piece. And then the, um, I would say the th top three behaviors that we've already talked about, pausing, downward flexion, warm smile. Those would be the main things to keep people safe in challenging situations. Except for most of us, we have to practice it before we actually need it. Because when we're under pressure, we go to our default. So don't think that just this conversation, oh, I made a note, I've written down the three things. Next next Tuesday when I have that conversation with Steve, I'll be ready. No, you got to practice those behaviors so that they will you'll have them available to you under pressure. Fantastic. Uh, and maybe you know too close, too close. You know, you know, we chose the topic. You know, dealing with difficult business partner, right? So, and uh, dealing with aggressive people is something that was mentioned by some of the people, and also something that uh, when I did the survey on LinkedIn uh, ahead of this meeting was something which impacted about you know one third of uh, the responded to my survey. So, what is an effective way? to neutralize an aggressive person? Oh, thank you for asking this, Giuseppe, because I, I, like me, when I'm in my classes, I say, okay, so who has ever been verbally aggressed in your personal life or professional life? 99% of those hands go up. <laughs> Sometimes people raise two hands. And it is a, a skill that can, you can absolutely neutralize it. Now, Giuseppe, I have a video that I made on my website. I don't know if you, I could, I don't know if I can post a link or something. I can send it to you if you want to. Okay. And though I'm going to explain this very briefly to... If you tell me what is the website, I can type it right away. Sure. Um, it's uh, it's Carol Coaching. You go to videos. And and I can cut and... Can I cut and paste Carol somewhere? Coaching, CarolCoaching.com. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. CarolCoaching.com. And then slash videos. 
Or uh, just the then on the right hand side, you see the three green bars. Yeah. Click on that, then go down to videos. And then about uh, the second row on the right, far right second row, it will show you neutralizing a verbal aggressor. So while Giuseppe's pulling that up, here, my friends, are the tips. You want to keep your body really calm. And this takes time to train because it's so scary when someone's verbally aggressive to us, even if we know physically we're not in danger. So you want to train your body to stay calm and do something called the neutral stance. For those of you who do yoga, you know it as mountain stance. So hands are relaxed at your sides. So you don't, you're not protecting in any way. Believe it or not, even in a challenging situation, you want to have a soft smile. And if you're combining that with active listening, uh-huh, yep, I see. It won't look sarcastic, and I, I can appreciate why that would be a concern. So, Or if it's the person's really aggressive, you think no smile is, is the right thing, then trust your instinct. So then it might look like this, uh-huh, yep, I see. And then you, this I call the peace offering, so you're extending your hand out, yep. Okay, and you are not doing any attempt to talk because if they're being verbally aggressive, they're doing all the talking. Let them do it. You're going to be tempted to defend and justify and explain. Don't do it. Wait for them to just wind themselves down, though you want to stay active, calm body, direct eye contact, perhaps a smile or not, extended hand. Uh huh. Yep, I see. And what happens is, when someone's being verbally aggressive to us, they are expecting us, unconsciously, they're expecting us to either go predator or go prey. When we do neither, what happens in their brain is confusion. And right after confusion is the thought, I'm fighting by myself. I'm going to look really stupid in a minute if I keep misbehaving. Now, again, this is all happening rapid fire in their brains unconsciously. And what that does, they don't want to look stupid. So they are going to recalibrate their own behavior and they will adjust. Now, the way they spoke to you, completely unacceptable. Though, sadly, unfortunately, in that moment, you do not get to point that out. <laughs> Your job, believe it or not, is to pretend not to notice they've been difficult, act like they're being a partner, engage with them. Uh-huh. Yeah, I see. So Giuseppe, now, now Giuseppe has finally stopped. If I understand correctly, we re you're really pissed off about the budget issue. And if Giuseppe has said to me, I'm pissed off, then that would be, I might use that wording. Now, if he uses, I'm fucking blah, 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 then I probably wouldn't say, add that. That's a little too much color, and he wouldn't say that anyway. Though you you, you can use some of their, their angry language, feeding it back to them, as long as it's not extreme. And what happens very quickly is when and and when I've done this in real life, people will settle down within sometimes less than a minute. Now, a minute can feel like an eternity. Sometimes it happens in 15, 20 seconds. And you'll know it's worked because they're either going to thank you, they're going to apologize, or they're going to go out of their way to help you. So I would say watch the video. You can um, also read the story in the Ego Tango about pretending not to notice the other person's being difficult. And with that, magic is going to happen more often in your lives. Wow. I mean, that was really, that was really a great session. I mean, thank you very much because, you know, uh, we had an unprecedented number of questions and comments from our audience. So really generated uh, a lot of things now you know here's the website that kieran is also putting so check the material from amy her book you also have uh, the name of her book that we put in the comments the ego tanko so don't uh, uh, you know of course you can also find the uh, amy on linkedin so do not hesitate to connect with both of us if you enjoy this event and by the way, we didn't tell you about our next event, but uh, if you're interested in uh, negotiation, then uh, how about joining us for the next LinkedIn Live, which is uh, on the 1st of March at 1 o'clock. And we're going to look at managing project sales negotiations. So 
what is different when negotiating for projects? And uh, we'll leave the perspective of a sales vice president that will share uh, her wide experience uh, on uh, those type uh, of negotiation. And uh, building also what we discussed before about uh, how you behave differently, whether you are in Europe, in the US, in Japan, then uh, we have an also the opportunity 4th of March. 4th of March at two o'clock, I'm running a webinar about cross-cultural negotiation. So another opportunity, cross-cultural negotiation on the 4th of March, two o'clock. Okay, then thank you very much for your very active participation. Very much enjoyed it. And uh, we are just putting the links to the webinar on the chat so that uh, in case you're interested, you can sign up uh, in the chat. Amy, it was uh, once again a pleasure to spend time with you. Same it's here. insightful what you shared. And uh, yeah. from the comment I get from the audience, you know, the pleasure was uh, shared by so many. So, well, all the very best. Enjoy Super. your weekend to you, Amy, and to everyone in the audience. And uh, uh, look forward to reconnecting with you all soon. Ciao, Giuseppe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Amy. Bye-bye.